Okay. Hey. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Lorax. Yeah. I'm going to start by describing how this is going to work. So they didn't number the pages in the Lorax. Oh. So they're just... Well, um, maybe they did, actually, in, Another in the actual book. To the consumerism and how nobody cares about what page they're on. <laughs> well, we have a, a large... It's called... What is it called? Six by Seuss. I, I knew it had. I knew it Six had. Six by one of those Seuss. Names. That could easily be yeah. like a Quentin Tarantino like psychopath movie. <laughs> Six by Seuss. Yeah, and it's kind of like the Son of Sam killer, you know. Exactly. Like, anyways, so there's actually eight stories in here. I don't know why they call it Six by Seuss, but I'm not clever enough to put together a joke like that. No. I'm like trying to come up with it, where it's like. I'm trying to, like, think about the way that he he words things. He so, would name them? So that, he, like, the way that he would, like, toy with his victims, where it was like, I'm going to kill you. Kill you with this knife. I'm <laughs> going to kill you. I will end your life. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the Dr. Seuss killer. That would actually be pretty terrifying. Yeah. People are terrified of rhymes like they are clowns. R- oh, rhymes, yeah. 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 Uh, so... They're all numbered, whatever, like Clowns. 200 and something through 300 and something, because that's like where they are in right. this book that I have. So I've decided to number them based off pages that have words on them. So any singular page that has words, I'm calling like page one and then page two and then page three. Right. So, and then anytime it has like two or three words, you guys are going to hear flipping and that's because we have a book here it's authentic yeah exactly it's authentic as fuck um moments when there's like Rah. two words on a page i'm just going to combine those pages together mm. um that way it was probably the easiest way to go through it because it's such a short book were we thinking about trying to make these podcasts family friendly well i definitely wanted them to be more family friendly than some of the originals had been let's do that because i've already sworn this time so let's like let's make it this the last motherfucking uh, <laughs> podcast <laughs> <laughs> the last A discussion that is not intended for children. But beyond this... Why is the Lorax the last non-intended? That I should s- be the first one. Because I already swore. We can't restart this. Children begin three minutes in. <laughs> after all the swearing is gone. You were trying to do a Dr. Seuss there? No. Children begin three minutes in. After all the swearing is gone. <laughs> okay, now we're, doing, now we're devolving into limericks. So that's what are you not devolving? That's that, evolving. That's, that's that's upgrading. It's appropriate to the medium. He doesn't really do limericks. He does what's referred to as iambic pentameter, and that's iambic pentameter. Yeah, that's, that's what his. It's called. That's his. Um, that's the murder weapon. <laughs> Doctor Seuss in the study with the iambic pentameter. But the murder has one parameter. It must oh. be done with an iambic pentameter. <laughs> Now he sounds like he's taking out a contract on somebody. <laughs> Doesn't sound like a murderer anymore. Good evening, 47. Good evening, <laughs> Seuss. <laughs> so the Lorax has a movie, and I said I was going to oh, watch it before this discussion. Fuck the movie. But I didn't watch it, so that is not a topic <laughs> for this was, discussion. Was I, the intention to talk about the movie? Well, I had heard the movie had diverged from the book, and I wanted to comment on that. Diverged is a bit of an understatement. It does exactly what the do- do- the the original book... I mean, you're going to go into what the book's about. Yeah. But it's about the dangers of consumerism and the, the way that we all fucking ravage whatever we want to get what we want, right? And that's what the movie is. It's a giant consumerist thing. There were car commercials with fucking Loraxes in them. It's awful. It's it's amazingly terrible. There's a, I highly recommend the uh, I Hate Everything's video on, on it. Because he so perfectly goes through what's wrong with it. So maybe I'll watch it first, get angry, and then watch the I Hate Everything video. Yeah. Okay. So this, yeah, will only cover the written Lorax by Dr. Seuss. Mm. That's That will be the topic today. So let's just start with uh, page one, The Street of the Lifted Lorax. The, is it, does it take place in Tatooine? Uh, because this this painting looks just like Tatooine. So so there's a, an Ontario city mm. uh, named Sudbury, 
And in Sudbury, they used to have mining operations in which they would do open burnings okay. where they would pile ore in these thin layers and then stack wood, like these massive pyres. Hmm. So they would have wood that's, let's say, maybe two, three stories high. And they wow. would burn this whole pyre because that amount of heat would cause the ore to give up its metal. Whoa. So that's how they used to do that. But... Burning it puts so much soot and particulates and gas in the air yeah. that it killed everything around Sudbury. So Sudbury has all these really barren hills because everything Whoa. at the tops of the hills died first. And they can't get anything to regrow there because none of the soil will stay. All the rain washes it away. Oh, fuck. So there even used to be, like, these <clears throat> these stories about how um, they would train astronauts in Sudbury because it looked like the surface of the moon. <laughs> that was, like, the thing for many years, people used to say. They filmed the second season of uh, Letterkenny in Sudbury. Really? Yeah. Okay, well, it's come along <laughs> since then. Well, Letterkenny not, is not supposed to be, in like... In the moon section. Yeah, There's exactly. no moon part of Letterkenny. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So I think that's kind of what this is like. You're, he's looking at the page in the book and everything looks destroyed. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly why. Because the first page of the book is set in the future. Like mm. after the Lorax is gone. Right. That's why it's called the Street of the Lifted Lorax. So for some reason, it says at the far end of town. Which implies that this environmental disaster only exists in one half right. of the town. Makes sense. That's where all the shit got done, you know? Yeah, because that's how the environment works. It's yeah. all localized yeah, exactly. to one little spot. Yeah, just a small rain cloud over the... And it says where the grinkle grass <laughs> grows. So I'm guessing the grinkle grass is like a weed of some sort. Or it is like marijuana. Well, there's obviously that option, but people would live there if it was marijuana. But not if maybe... I don't know. Go ahead. If you think, <laughs> if there was grinkle grass growing spontaneously, people would move there like that. Oh, absolutely. Uh, but it also says the wind smells sour and slow when it blows. So slow when it blows. The slow wind. Yeah. And then, so this young boy, I guess, is kind of the the main character of the story. And he is going to investigate the street of the lifted Lorax. The one-eyed fish-looking kid? Yeah, yeah, the one-eyed boy. If you can find pictures to go along with this, I, I suggest you do, or if you do have the book. I, I find it's more fun. It is a um, a read-along type of book. A read-along? Yeah. A read-along book. What does that mean? Where, like... Other books don't expect you to read along? Well, no. Very few times do people sit down and read Frankenstein aloud to others. Oh, read right? aloud. Yeah. Yeah. Read along. Read along is As more in like multiple people yeah, reading the same book exactly. with one person. Yeah, in school, I hated or... that shit, <laughs> dude. There yeah, was but this... no one's forcing you to do this one. Yeah, well, they they forced me to do it in high school, or I mean, every all school. And there was this one time where um, he uh, there there was a I I didn't know how to say whore. I've never, I never saw oh. it spelled, right? Hower. It's, yeah. So this, uh, I, it, my my turn just ended and this other dude ter took over and he knew how to say it. And I was like, fuck, that could have been me. I could have been like, war. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a uh, war. I've heard that before. That's a tough one, reading aloud when you don't necessarily know all the words. Asia go. Asia go. That's a great one. Ashwago. <laughs> I've heard. I don't mind a shwago or um, Asasago. I've heard that before, <laughs> even though that's like too many S's. I've but heard Parmesian. Parmesian. Yeah, that's a good one. That's that's as good as dandelion. Dandelion. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god! Have you ever seen a picture of a dandelion? Oh no, that's it's, funny. It's a lion, but it has a yellow flowered mane. <laughs> And it's got like a, one of the white part yeah, of the dandelions on his tail. Of his tail. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. All right. So page two, where the Lorax once stood. So the boy goes and finds like this place where supposedly the Lorax once was. And it says, if you look deep enough, you can still find where the Lorax once stood before somebody lifted the Lorax away. Lifted? Like airlifted? It just says, well, that's why it's called the Street of the Lifted Lorax, because somehow the Lorax was lifted away. But why would you name the street after this guy? 
Because clearly the people who run the administration in this town don't like him because they ruin the fucking place. No, but you, you're forgetting there. <laughs> Actually, we're not getting there. That's at the end of the story, but it's, you'll find out. No, the story begins after the shit hit the fan. It's clear that this place was fucked up. Yeah, well, that's the same as, like, you have some sort of, you know, massacre that happens, and then you name a street after mm. the victims of that massacre or something like that. Mm. Or, you know... When a president gets assassinated, JFK. you name like a thousand streets after him. Yeah, Same JFK idea. Report, yeah. So the Lorax got lifted away, which, yeah, who knows what that means. But either way, they probably named the street after him because because they missed him mm. or they, you know, wished he would come back. Come back, lifted Lorax. So this must have been many years ago because it obviously says deep in the Grinkle Grass. So you have to imagine that this is like this huge forest sort Stay of. Stay out of the Grinkle Grass. Don't go near the Grinkle Grass. Stay out. The Grinkle uh, so page three, <laughs> the war, the Onceler still lives here. That's right, the Onceler. I the forgot about that. A, is that supposed to be like a joke? It's like I once, I was once the guy. I was w- the w- <laughs> Onceler. Interesting, because kind of that's what he is. He's the guy who once was. He's the Onceler. Right. He's the guy. So, the, yeah. The, the Onceler. It's confusing to spell too, because it's once dash lur. Oh, yeah. Maybe it was a misprint. Maybe it was a misspelling. Maybe it was like ounce lur. He he sold Grinkle Grass by the ounce. <laughs> He's the ounce lur. No, it's 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 definitely the once lur. It's spelled O N C E. Oh, I know it's like the once, once upon a time. Yeah. It oh, it's, it's uh, I actually have a friend whose last name is um. Uh, mispronunciation really yeah because he was the way he pronounced it was supposed to end in h-a-l but they just didn't hear him right so they'd put h-l they missed the a in the middle and it just stuck and that's their last name yeah it's just it's down a letter because they didn't hear the way he pronounced it when he came into the country oh shit yeah so that's (laughs) so their last name ends in ul instead of hall wow (laughs) yeah that's it's hilarious. Fascinating. Yeah, it's, it's one of those weird historical context things that doesn't even really have a valid reason. It's well, just I always I always wonder about uh, last names like Freeman and White and Black, and it's like, what was happening back then? Mm-hmm. It was just like, we're the Whites. <laughs> it's like, okay. <laughs> I wonder if White came from like Wyatt, you know, like W H Y. It could be T E or because that's White as well. Maybe they were just really into snow <laughs> people also pick their last names at certain points in history several right. points in history that's, that's not, not even that thing. far not even that long ago yeah well today people are still picking their last names every now and then it's just not as common yeah i actually met a guy who uh um his last name he has five last names or no he doesn't have last names he has five first names and what? The, they're, the, they're the last five generations of John, the first... John, Jacob, Jingleheimer, Schmidt. Basically. <laughs> all the way back, like, like the last five generations of men in his family are his first five names. So he goes by his very first name. And then he ha- his last name is like four letters, which is based on something else. Whoa. But speaking with the Jingleheimer Schmidt, how fucking dumb is that song? Is that song supposed to like make people crazy? Is it about a crazy person intending to make people crazy? Yeah, it's an endless song. Yeah, I understand. It's like the first endless you, song. You can endless song a lot of things, but like, so John Jacob Jingleheimer Schmidt, his name is my name too. Okay, so you kind of, you've like already wasted my time. Because <laughs> it's true, because I and know then, your name is Becca, so shut the fuck and, up. And then whenever he goes out. <laughs> this is so not family the, friendly. The, the people always shout, there, there goes, goes John him. Jacob Jingleheimer it's Schmidt. Like, What's the what's the fucking point of the story? Like, my name is Mitch. But you forgot about the la 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 la. Yeah, well, exactly. Right, exactly. It's like my name is Mitch, and when I go out, people are like, "Hey, Mitch." Of course, it makes sense. It's my name. It would be weird if they said other things. See, what I think you don't realize is what they're saying is, John Jacob Jingleheimer Schmidt. His name is my name too. So there is no other person. I am John Jacob Jingleheimer Schmidt. I'm just mentally crazy, so oh. that's how I'm saying it to you. But every time I go outside, people yell my name, and that freaks me out. So that la 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 at the end, that's me running home scared. 
and then I go back or, out and people well, yell at me again. At the same time, I imagine when I go out, people don't go, there's Mitch. Like, it's like, yeah, there it's goes John up. Jacob. Cause, because it's like, don't go near John Jacob yeah. Jingle Hammer Schmidt. He has too many names. He has too many reasons to hurt you. Don't trust a man with two first names <laughs> or a name like that. He's got two first names plus whatever Jingleheimer Schmidt it's supposed to be. Yeah. Is that multiple last names? Yeah. 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 Two first names and two last names? How can you trust that guy? Mm. He might, might as well be two people. Yeah. So the Wensler still lives here in this environmental disaster. And it's starting to ask the questions, uh, what is the Lorax? Why was he lifted away? Where was he lifted to? And then it says, ask the Wunstler, because he still lives here, so maybe he knows mm. what happened. Actually, it says he still knows. He does still know. So the Wunstler lives in his Lurkim. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's spelled L-E-R-K-I-M. Okay. But he lurks in his Lurkim, cold under the roof. <laughs> <laughs> that's what it says. And he makes his own clothes out of Miff Mufford Moof. <laughs> There are moments in this story where he feels like a brilliant writer and other moments where he feels like a brilliant children's writer. Well, he's making shit up to rhyme. Yeah, exactly. In some moments, it's it's brilliant. Other moments, it's like, I can tell that you just needed the rhyme here. Like yeah. Miff, Miff, Mufford, Moof. See, no part of that sentence was real. The, the A lot of it, like, I think that Dr. Seuss in some way was a... Um, an inspiration to Justin Roiland, who made, who uh, um, does um, Rick, and Rick and Morty. But I think an inspiration in a ridiculous sense. Yeah. Where he does that sleeve oh. thing. And the thing about that is that... Oh, that's how they make plumbuses. <laughs> yeah. I always wondered. <laughs> is that he does this ridiculous story where he makes up all these words, but he uses the same word again. So it feels like it's Real. connected. Yeah. Like the slurp is then put into the schmoof. And then the slurp is like, the rest of the slurp is like cut off and reused yeah. or something. Yeah, because if you it's just like, say random crap, yeah. people just see it as random crap. But if, you know, well, for example, we're about to get into Thneeds. Yeah. But the Thneed is written on every page. So all of a sudden it becomes like, okay, yeah, there's this yeah. thing, this Thneed. But yeah, like the dude's making it out of Mick Muck or Moof. And, like, and then it goes away. That's the only time he mentions <laughs> it. It comes back. He's like, oh, okay, what rhymes with roof that I can make clothes out of? Let's make <laughs> some Moof. That's like... Cause I've I've been I've been doing a lot of writing recently, and I go through many many drafts, and I keep saving them as new ones so that I can go back to the first draft and say like, See what it. the fuck were you doing back then? And there's times where I just like I force uh, a whole statement because in order for it to end in the joke I want it to end in, and by the third draft the joke's gone because it was never good enough to get in there, and forcing some dumb thing. Ruined. Was, yeah, it was no point. It was like it, it, it detracts. As soon as people notice one of your fifty jokes is off, it makes all of the other ones feel weird. Yeah, and so that's the type of thing that maybe a second draft could have helped. <laughs> yeah, I think that's actually one of the only points in this story I have that feeling. Mm. Like almost every other page and every other rhyme is like generally pretty damn good. But yeah. I always get to that one and I'm like, Miff <laughs> Mufford, <laughs> move. <laughs> This yeah okay okay so he makes his own clothes. It feels like something one of those like deep uh, voice actors would have would have done like the way that BoJack Horseman has like, like James Earl Jones. Well, there's like it's like a this is Miff Mufford Moof. <laughs> well, there's a there's a character who's a cat in who's a, a, a like a, a really like a hard ass uh, poli poli no it's a hard ass uh, <laughs> it's a hard ass police officer who's a, a cat. Okay, and he's like he's like. I'll get, he's like, I'm going to take this guy down if my name isn't Fuzzy Face. <laughs> meow, meow, Fuzzy Face. <laughs> it's like moments like that where yeah. it's like, and he's looking, he's like, who here has Miff Mufford move? <laughs> it feels intense, but it's not. So this actually would have been perfect if we were recording this a month ago. Oh, look at this. Look at this hard indentation. The way that the, these last two lines are like half- of the space. I also really love his generous ass margins here. Yeah. He, he's basically like whoever made this giant book has essentially put like 
the rule of thirds that you're supposed to use in movies and, and television, they've essentially applied that to this book where all the t- all the writing is in the, the, the very center of rectangle. And it's good. And all of his books seem to be like that, where they may not necessarily be centered, but they have a really good place to mm-hmm. put the words. And I like that. Um, helps yeah, with the flow. I, I like the writing over the, the drawings because it makes it feel all like all uh, together. Yeah. Because this... this the page you have open right now. We're looking at a blank page accompanied by an image page. Yeah, which is how a lot of a lot of children's books can be written, but it, man, it makes it there's a disconnect. Yeah, the first three pages we went through were all were text on image. Mm-hmm. This is just text on blank. So yeah, it's it's a little different. But sometimes when there is more words, it is kind of nice. Like you'll see some of the other ones have a lot more writing. Mm. Uh, but it would have been perfect if this was a month ago because it says, on special dank midnights in August, he peeks out of his shutters. Dude, dudes are peeking on dank nights with their gringle grass? <laughs> Dude, the fucking guy was right writing a, so- a story about weed. And sometimes he speaks. <laughs> every every now and then. He was peeking, dude. And it says, perhaps he'll tell you if you're willing to pay. For the gringle grass. Yes, apparently. It's all about what, how much you want that peak, bro. So page five, he lets down a pail. And you have that to toss like, in. That sounds like a... <laughs> it sounds like a, like a... Not a euphemism, but a, a, like something in like An a, analogy. certain types of neighborhoods. And he's like, you toss on your pail? It's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> it's like, dude. A type of slang? Dude, you got to toss on your pail. So he tosses down a pail, and you have to toss in 15 cents and a nail and the shell of a great-great-grandfather's snail. That's the cost. So, first of all... <laughs> he just munches on it. He's like, I love the grandfather snail. Yeah, that's what's I love, weird. I love knowing that several children and grandchildren will miss the snail. What can he do with a nail? Why does he need 15 cents if he doesn't leave his house? And is he going to eat that snail? Well, he probably pays some person like cause it, oh it's to bring him stuff yeah, yeah. it's true because he, he lowers a pail on the other side so of, you can tell this book was written a long time ago when 15 cents would actually buy you something maybe 15 cents is more of a gesture like a wishing well yeah, hey, yeah. toss in some coins exactly and uh so then this is where it gets a little weird here um, so page six and seven, his secret strange hole in his <laughs> groovyless glove. <laughs> so his secret strange hole. So he pulls up, so he pulls up the tail <laughs> and makes sure you put everything in it. And this is a quote now. Then he hides what you've paid him away in his snub, his secret strange hole in his groovyless glove. What? So, so what he's the like. Fuck? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't write it, okay? I'm just reading it off. And then he grunts, actually, which is weird. But he drops down a whisper phone. So, okay, sorry. Okay, let's, let's go over this again. So he grunts after he hides something in his secret hole. His secret strange hole. Then he whispers in your ear? Yeah. <laughs> Essentially using, like, a cup on a string. Thanks for the snail. So, <laughs> I appreciated that. He was old, very old. <laughs> so the whisper of a phone comes down, and the kid can't really hear him. So page eight, smallish bees up his nose. Smallish bees? Yeah, like not big bees. Small, he puts <laughs> bees in his nose? No, no. So he lowers this hose down, and the hose is described as being a snurgly hose. <laughs> the first word on this page is, is slop. Slop. <laughs> slop. Yeah. So s- down slups the whisper of phone. Dude, there was the I think it was the third episode of our Titanfall 2 playthrough where I was doing like a sound and I was trying to do that as the description, like the oh, sound of a yeah. fart, and I didn't know how to write it. But I actually went to Reddit and I was like, how do I <laughs> write how do I fart write sound. a fart? And I found like eight <laughs> different versions of it. It was so funny. <laughs> Because each one, like, you can tell what type of fart they're talking about. Oh, where it's my like God. F, F's and W's and P's. Yeah. F's okay. and L's and P's. Like, <laughs> P, F's and T's. They're totally different types of farts. And then there's B, R, T. That's always... Yeah. Bert. Yeah. <laughs> Bert. Never, never seen that one? I've seen it. Um, so, yeah, he lowers this snurgly hose down, which makes it sound like he has smallish bees up his nose. That's the description. The, the, yeah, they're really weird. 
You got secret holes in grunting, whispering, and a snuggly hose. Well, it's also we're adults reading it. As a kid, you would just be like, oh, he's got bees up his nose because he sounds snuggly. Yeah, but at this point, I would be like, okay, I don't know about this one, guys. Like, I think we're going to have to move on to the story. Like, yeah, anyway. we're going to read The Grinch instead. And in the end, they saved the world. Yeah, it was skip. Uh, yeah, okay. Skip to the end. Anyway, this kid with 500 hats. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to Bartholomew and see what he's doing with his hats. So it says, it says the Wunzler told him with his teeth sounding gray. I don't know what that means. I don't know either. Yeah, it just that's in there. He's like, yeah, I got nothing. He says with his teeth sounding gray. Okay, I mean, maybe just one of those things people understand from like a different era. When was this written? <laughs> Is he just like got like the, that that wheeze? Like, let me tell you. Like he's just, I don't know, like, why, does he sound like he's been smoking his whole life? I think it probably, it's probably more like, Let what? me tell you, son. What? <laughs> what? Okay. So, it started a long time ago, he says, and this is where we're introduced to the truffle trees. Look at trees. the colors. Page nine, the truffle trees. It's so pretty. <clears throat> so, we've gone back in time from... Wensler Wagon. A wasteland. Yeah, the Wensler Wagon. I like that. <laughs> So we've gone from a wasteland back to a beautiful forest and a pond and there's animals and you see swami swans flying through the air. There's real color too. Yeah, the truffle trees are purple and yellow and orange and pink. And that's actually about it. They don't have any green, believe it or not. I believe so it. the grass was still green. Everything was nice. The clouds were fresh and it actually smelt nice rather Ooh. than sour and polluted. The air was fast. And the Wunzler was just sort of caught off guard by the trees, by how beautiful these trees were. So I'm guessing they're not native to wherever the Wunzlers come from. Oh, it's bears! Page 11 and 12. Under the trees and in the pond. So there's these bears called brown barbaloots. And they're, they're essentially bear humans. They remind me of the Bernstein bears a little bit. And I don't know... They, yeah, they, they, well, they kind of look like the bears on wheels. Which, yeah. by the way, are yeah. we going to do a mini discussion on Bears on Wheels? I'd be down. That's a fucking dope yeah. like, story. That's, One bear on two I'm, wheels. Isn't it like a story of excess about how when you get 100 bears on 100 wheels that people die? No, not exactly. Isn't that how it ends? Like yeah, 100 it does. bears on 100 wheels? Yeah, it's 100 bears on 100 wheels, and then it's 100 bears on no wheels. Yes. And zero bears on 100 wheels. <laughs> <laughs> I think it ends with one bear on one wheel. <laughs> Is Seuss like one of the first? Uh, did he write that? Trolls, bears on wheels. Maybe I don't not. Know, I don't know if Seuss did that. One of the first trolls. That just that's just a troll story. The bears on wheels. Yeah, because yeah. it's like it's it's very it's very expected. You know, it's like one bear on one wheel, unicycle. One bear on two wheels, bicycle, and it's like slowly yeah. increasing. And like the whole the end where it's like. No bears on no wheels and, or sorry, no bears on a hundred wheels and a hundred bears on no wheels. That just feels like a big troll joke. Yeah, well, that like, escalated quickly. <laughs> the whole thing was like leading to that. Oh, they actually also have, um, at home, I still have 10 hungry monsters. Mm. Or one hungry monster, one hungry yeah. monster. Yeah, that's it. So maybe, maybe more kids books in the future. So these brown barbaloots, they eat truffle fruits. Did you, is that how he rhymed it or is that how you rhymed it? No, that's how he rhymed it. Oh, good for him. Yeah, so, oh, Dr. Seuss just, 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 figured just, out a rhyme. <laughs> just consider that you can actually take credit for a lot of this stuff because the, the, the people interested in listening to a discussion about this story are probably not going to check out this story. True. It's a demographic we're going after. True. So I can be like uh, when we went to that Ninja Sex Party concert. Yeah. And he's like, a lot of our younger fans think that we wrote this song and we don't correct them. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. then they played What's It Called? Everybody Wants to Rule the World. Yeah, yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. We, yeah. we think that's awesome, so we don't correct them. <laughs> <laughs> so there's these barbaloots that eat the truffle of fruits and they hide in the shade of the trees. And then there's these humming fish that swim in the ponds. So they actually sing, mm. like they hum, essentially. But by the way, I want to mention this at the beginning here so that people can appreciate it. So I don't know if Dr. Seuss intended on this, but the way that he writes his words uh, is like a wave form. So it's like da da ba da ba da ba da ba da ba ba boo. 
That's iambic pentameter. Exactly. Yeah. And the wave is supposed to actually put kids to sleep. Oh, really? Yeah. So the combination of bright colors, simple stories that explain, like, real life, and uh, and that wave and... <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, it's, it's all intent. It, it, the whole thing, I have a feeling that Dr. Seuss's intention here was that all of this was supposed to be helpful for parents. Like, yeah. this is a great thing for you to tell your kids, but it's also going to put them to sleep because it's hard to get kids to sleep. It's true. You cannot get enough things in the world to get kids to sleep. But it's true that if you, when you start fucking up the rhymes, the kids will start to wake up because yeah. it's jarring. It's that, it's that, da 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 Those two aren't going to fit in. It's going to wake up the kids. How do they spell, how does he spell Seuss? Kind of weird, right? Uh, S U E S E U S S. Oh, okay. Like, uh, I'm high school if... Zeus. Is it Z Z U Z E U S? It is E U. Yeah. Okay. Um, so imagine if there was some dude out there who fucking hated kids and he made like a whole version, like, he made everything look like Zeus. He was spelled with, like Zeus, Dr. With a, Swess, like just S- backwards with a, Z, with a Z or something in there, and it was just like ha ba ba da ba, a ship ba da ba, a da ba da ba ha. Like everything was like j- suddenly janky. And then everyone died. <laughs> yeah, it was the last like, three. The bears were on wheels, and then they all fell, and then the, some guy drove over them with a shovel. <laughs> and then they were driven over by a car. And then the, the end. And then the insurance company refused to pay out, and they lost their jobs. <laughs> And then there was an extreme amount of pressure on their marital environment after and that. And workman's comp wouldn't cover it because they technically weren't <laughs> And then it turns employed. into a novel about, like, the aftermath of falling off. So the first, like, ten pages is a kid's book and the last 200 is a novel. Well, apparently, um, is it Full Metal Jacket? I think it's Full Metal Jacket. There's a movie, there's, like, a cult classic movie out there. And the whole first bit is, like, a comedy. And then the second half is like a dark horror because one of the characters flips. Like he 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 fucking loses it. I didn't know that. And starts going off like starts like killing people that he knows. That's why I've heard such conflicting stories about that movie. Yeah. Because it's two movies. That's the the you probably heard this um this this audio clip. Oh, what is that? What the fuck is that? Maybe. It's uh he finds a jelly donut in one of the soldiers' lockers. And uh, so he he says uh, he uh, he he makes him eat the jelly donut while every one of the other soldiers does push-ups. Mm-hmm. And he says, from now on, I will not be punishing you for jelly donuts. I will be punishing everyone else in your squad, which oh. means your squad is now the one who are going to watch you. They are going to make sure that you don't have jelly donuts yeah. because they're the ones who have to do this shit. That's hilarious. I'm pretty sure Vincent Denot. I think maybe maybe he just looks like Vincent D'Onofrio. I don't know who that is. He plays uh, Kingpin on uh, the Netflix TV show. Oh, okay. It might be Vincent D'Onofrio who's the jelly-eating guy. Maybe he just looks like him. In full- oh, because it's a long time ago. Yeah. Could be. So the, the one slur, first of all, is always depicted as arms. The only thing you ever see about the one slur is arms. Guy's got arms. He's got arms, guy, man. Guy, that's... <laughs> he's these green. He actually looks like the Grinch a little bit. He's got these green arms, and that's all you ever get. You get, like, his hands operating controls. In this picture, he's, like, bending a truffle a tree over so that he can rip, rip the tufts off of it. Just kind of a dick move, actually. The one slur wagon is such a swag thing to do. Yeah, the one slur wagon. He's riding around in his, for some reason, why Why would he do that? That's such a silly way of designing that wagon. I know it's for kids, but normally you have two things that attach to your horse on the left and the right. I, I am looking at what you're and looking it's at. A, it's a center. It's, a, it's, it's one thing in the center that's attached to his horse, but it's... On the right, on the side, right side of the, of the horse. Yeah. So, like, the horse must have a hard time with, like, one side of his legs. There'd be serious ergonomic issues. Like, yeah, he would probably... Yeah, his joints are all fucked. Yeah. His whole skeleton would be messed up. Although the horse looks pretty happy. But either way, kid's story. Uh, so, <laughs> page 12 and 13, trees such as these. So, the truffle trees are apparently super, super soft. And, like, softer than silk, even. Mm. And they smell of sweet butterfly milk. Sure. Whatever. Whatever. So then the one says, 
I felt a great leaping in my heart of, oh, pff. I felt a great leaping of joy in my heart. I knew just what I'd do. I unloaded my cart. Mm. So the onceer, I guess, I don't know what he does because they never really talk about it, but he has an ax, he has sewing equipment, he has all this stuff that's kind of uniquely suited for working with truffle trees. So even though he seems surprised by the truffle trees, it seems like he came here for them. Right. Seems like he didn't roll up on these and went, oh, what a beautiful business Ooh. opportunity. It looks like someone told him there's soft ass trees that way. He's like, uh, he's like, it's like an M. Night Shyamalan film. Uh, with the twist, you mean? Where everyone's like, oh, he just happened upon it, but it turns out he was there. He knew they were there the whole time. Is that how all M. Night Shyamalan movies work? Yeah. I'm not that familiar with him, to be <clears throat> honest. Boy. How does that go? Meets world? Boy. Boy meets girl. No. I forget. It was a joke that somebody made about his, his, his work, where it was like, boy meets... Uh, girl, boy eats girl. Girl was a chip. Man was eating chips. Am I a <laughs> <laughs> That is kind of what it's like. It's like you're too zoomed in to see the perspective. Yeah, well, it's kind of like the with the Onceler here, where he's just described his arms. That's clearly an intention to make some sort of statement at the end of the of the, fil- of the uh, to story. To confuse right? it, yeah, it's true. Otherwise, they'd show you who he was and describe mm. him perfectly. Oh, jeez. Are you Apparently. bored by this? St- oh, the waves are putting you to sleep, bro. Apparently, yeah, they're they're getting to me. The iambic pentameter is in my brain. You're not, you're not a caffeine guy. No, I'm not a caffeine. What do you do guy. for energy? Oh, right, eat healthy and yeah, exercise. Yeah. I forgot about that. Do, yeah, you know, I gotta work. I on let that. my the body supply the, yeah. the energy. <laughs> so, page fourteen with great speedy speed. All right. Mm-hmm. So the Wunsler builds a shop, and he chops down a single truffle a tree. But he also chops down with a single chop, which means that these are not super robust trees. So he builds a chop shop. And he right, chops, where he chops the, tree. the trees and then hops. And he says, with great skillful skill and with great speedy speed, he took the soft tuft and he knitted a thneed. So this is where we're introduced I, I, I to the thneed. I don't like, like, that's like, that's like describing a word with the word. Speedy speed, strengthy strength. Yeah. It's true. That's why there is a lot of great writing and a lot of lazy writing mm. that goes into it. But also it is for kids, so I see... That's the thing, though. You can... There's plenty of, of work out there done strictly for kids that can be... Um, that's like really well put together for adults, too. Yeah. And with all of my skill and all of my speed, I took the soft tuft and I knitted a thneed. Exactly. You already have the rhyming word. N- no joke, I've actually thought about rewriting some of Dr. Seuss's stories without the laziness. But <laughs> I wonder if it would even be as endearing. Because if I took all the laziness out, all the little weirdnesses out, yeah. it would be shitty. It would just be, like, bland. But some of Is them I find get in the way. Yeah, you're, you're hungry, bro. Is that me? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Wow. This just, just keeps going. You all right, bro? I'm fine. Okay. The, I was. You're right, though. But the the um, what'd you call it? Charm? Not charm. The endearing. Yeah. I was. I'm playing Rogue Trooper right now, and it has the silliest shit here and there. And I'm like, don't change, Rogue Trooper. Yeah. I don't want you to be polished. That's fucking hilarious. Yeah. Like you polish what 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 needs to be done for me to enjoy the game, and all the other silly shit with like Leave the way the way that the character like there's times where there's a cinematic where you know like the the scene where you're in a in a in a a, a chopper and you're shooting down dudes. Mm-hmm. There was there was a glitch that where I was playing where all of the dudes on on the ground were not shooting at me. They were in their rotation for the stealth section in that same level. So I'm there shooting at them, and they're all walking around like, nothing to report. And I'm like, <laughs> I love you, Rogue Trooper. This is hilarious. This is the type of, like, endearing thing you used to find back in, in the old day games, that I yeah. don't want anyone to change because that's what makes it so yeah, good. So you're true. right. The, the Perhaps these were actually intended to make kids feel like they could write Dr. Seuss. In probably in some ways, yeah. And... I think it's good and bad, but I think it's the way he chose to do it, and that's why it's important. Mm. Because people like Dr. Seuss, and I think that that's sort of where it all comes from. It's like, people like Dr. Seuss because the way he writes is great. There was um, a... It's just maybe not the way I would write for adults. That's the big thing. But it's not written for adults. Yeah. There was, um, there was a, a, a famous designer who said that he was famous 
for not having a style. And there were times where he would make he would make something look like it was made by a kid. And he said the hardest thing in his entire life of illustrating was to truly illustrate like a child. Because a child isn't just an unrefined... Whatever a child draws isn't just unrefined. It has... The proportions are all off. Things like so many things don't make sense, but you can tell immediately when you see a drawing of a ch- by a child that it was done by them, not just a poor, not just a bad drawing by an adult. He was saying trying to get in the mindset of a child is the hardest thing he's ever had to do. Was because he worked his whole life to refine his illustrations, and then suddenly he had these jobs where he had to go as far back as when he was a little kid with crayons. Yeah, whoa. So perhaps Dr. Seuss is more brilliant than we think. Perhaps he writes things in here to feel almost as though it was written by a super smart kid. Well, that's also one of the challenges I find in a lot of ways. Um, we have ex- you and me specifically have exceptionally high standards. Oh, absolutely. Of art and creativity and uh, just it generally works. Any any work someone could present. So I think in some ways, you know, we see tiny little things like that, and we consider them blemishes on the overall art. Yeah. But to them, yeah, you're right, like a kid with great speedy speed. Like, it, you know, for a kid, that actually might be, like, their favorite thing ever. Like, maybe they go out as, like, the onceler. Mm. And, they, you know, they've got, like, a sign hanging from them. He's just they got arms. green arms, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Actually, you know what? If I had, like, if I was doing um, a, a costume design, like, if you had a, you know, you're dressing up your whole family and you had a baby at the time, mm-hmm. you could just attach green arms to its stroller oh, and it yeah. would be the one slur. Oh, wow. And you could be the Lorax. <laughs> Somebody do that and then send a picture, oh, sure comment a picture. Oh, oh, that's funny. Okay, so right after he knits this sneed, he hears a gazump. Gazump. I guess, I don't know. He looks over, (laughs) and out of that stump, which is weird, but out of the stump, the the Lorax appears. Also, he was just hanging out in there. Either that or the Lorax. The Lorax is definitely more of a magical creature, so I imagine he exists throughout the whole forest. Mm. So when one was chopped down, that's where he appeared. Did he make... Is his beard made of silky silk? No, I don't think the Lorax is a truffle a tuft. I don't think he's a living tuft. He's he's like he's all he, he's all of the trees. Yes. He is the father of trees. Yeah, so well he so he asks him to describe him and he says he says if I'm to describe him I would say he's shortish, oldish, brownish and mossy and he spoke with a voice that was sharpish and bossy. So that's See, I like that there. That's cool. Yeah, the way that he wrote shortish and oldish or whatever it was. That, yeah, I, I appreciate that. Yeah, more than the the other the page. first page. Yeah. yeah. So then the Lorax comes out, and he says, "Mister, I am the Lorax. I speak for the trees." So that's who the Lorax Speaker is. Speaker of the trees. Yes. He Dude, speaks. Dude, finally answering the question Sixth has had since two thousand six. Who will speak for the trees? When will the forest speak? When the Lorax comes out of a stump. Yeah. <laughs> if the Lorax comes out of the stump and speaks, we got 12 more weeks of winter. <laughs> now that I'm thinking about it, you can probably tr- compare a lot of that song to this book. Really? Huh. Okay, maybe we'll have to do a discussion there's, there's of that song part afterwards. There's about the Yeti, and the, the Yeti is waiting to, to bring us into his home, treat us as one of his own, even though we're destroying his home. Huh. Yeah. The, Yeti. the Yeti. Is that supposed to be the, the Lorax? I guess it's like a, he's. It's I guess it's, it's like an abomination, like a person that you yeah, would the expect, Yeti, the Sasquatch, it's all. You, you'd expect him to be um, vicious, averted to humans. And that's why some people are able to say like that's okay to destroy the home of the Yeti because he's just some fucking asshole, even though he's actually looking to. He would take care of us if, if we he, were lost, yeah, if he had knowing to. that we are destroying his home. And the Lorax doesn't really take care of anything. He's definitely a naysayer for the whole story, but he's supposed to be a naysayer. So he's not a solution man. No. He's no. Da- he's he, Dale from Walking he's Dead. He's very much not a solution man. So he says he's speaking for the trees because the trees can't speak for themselves. And he's very upset because he doesn't know why the Onceler turned one of his trees into whatever a thneed is. He doesn't know. He doesn't understand why he needed to make a yeah. thneed. What if the Lorax never existed? 
and this is all an internal dialogue that the Onesler is having. What if the yeah? What if the Onesler uh, saw a man uh, appear from a tree, and he's he's a speaker of a tree. Nothing ever happens. The, the Lorax isn't like throwing shit in his 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 <clears throat> sneed machine. <laughs> he ain't like wrapping himself around trees and telling them to stop. He's just the speaker of the trees. What if he never existed in the first place? This, this is a way for the the Onesler's uh, con or um uh, what's the other word? Not consciousness, conscience to to uh, rationalize how he feels about taking down the trees. It's the manifestation of all of his reservations about destroying a forest. Yeah. That's actually not a bad idea, because you're right. The Onesler doesn't actually do... Or, sorry, the Lorax doesn't do anything physically. Because otherwise, the if, the, if, he, if the Lorax was really the speaker of the trees, he probably would have popped up much sooner. Before he cut it down. Way before. Yeah, like he would have been, been there for the first tree. He would have been like, hey... You can't do this shit. That's true. Why does the speaker for the trees only show up after the speaker for the trees? It's it's a build up. It's the it's the way for the 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 once there. I keep wanting to call him the oracle. The <laughs> once there is like he cuts down one tree and he's like whatever. The forest will 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 resolve this. It can take one tree. But he gets to a point where he starts to go. I don't know about this. Am I doing irreparable damage? And that's where he manifests the Lorax. The Lorax. So M. Night Shyamalan. So he says to the Lorax, the Onesler says, there's no cause for alarm. I only cut one tree. I'm doing no harm. Mm. So it's interesting because Classic. if the Lorax is another side of the Onesler, which it could be, even if it's not, the Onesler is still very much the side of progress. The mm. things that the Onesler says are still very much on the business side of things. And he says, I am being quite useful. This thing is a thneed, a super fine something that all people need. Mm. So what he's actually rationalizing is that he's helping. Right. Because he's making something that people need. He's filling, he's filling a purpose. Yes. And he says it can be used for basically anything. It's clothing. It can be used as a cover. It can be used as a pillowcase. And then the Lorax says, you're a fool. No one will buy that thneed. No one is going to pay you money for that. Right. And then immediately someone comes and buys it from the Onesler. Like and a second later. Immediately covers his face with the need. Because to... he's because he's embarrassed. He doesn't want to be associated with forest destruction. Oh. You should probably wait by like the 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 the, the, the Jick pennies. The what? The JC pennies. <laughs> you buy it there, that way you don't feel like it it came from the thing. Like, yeah, exactly. I would never. I would never buy chicken from a chicken farm. No, I buy it from the grocery store, where there's so many it makes you feel so yeah. many disconnections on the way there that I don't even. I realized that the other the other day, like I was I was like putting chicken nuggets on a like I was about to cook them for myself. And I'm just looking at them. I'm like, nothing in a chicken looks like that. No, not even close. There's, there's no square bits of chickens. No. So how did it get that way? Well, somebody yanked it out of a living creature and then mushed it into a thing. That's why, for the most part, I'm I'm happier when I'm not eating uh, meat. Like it's not. I love meat. It's great. Last yeah. night I had sausages. It's just the way you know. Meat's a big, still a big part oh, of sausage diet. Sausage is even worse. Yeah. But I like. Um, well, actually, not as much. The way they like stuff it in there. Yeah, but versus a chicken nugget. That's true. At least the sausage is just sheathed meat. Don't chickens go through much worse than cows? Chickens are also a lot dumber than cows, so mm. it's hard to... Like, cows will mourn the loss of their friends. Chickens don't understand anything that high level. The fucked up thing with cows is that they figure it out. Yeah. They know what they're on their way to. That's, that's a, yeah, exactly. a sad thing. Yeah, it was, which is why it's weird. I saw a YouTube video where somebody was talking about how you should stop eating chickens because you need something like 200 chickens to equivalent to to make up one cow worth of food. Right. But what they're not accounting for is the fact that chicken is a much leaner type of meat. Mm. And also that yeah, sure, chickens like have kind of shady lives sometimes where they get stuck in these tiny little pens. You know how long it takes for a chicken to mature? A couple weeks. Oh. Cows grow for a long yeah, time. They do. They're large animals. And also, like you said, they're terrified. And yeah. when it comes to cows, if a cow gets injured, they're reluctant to kill it 
because they still want the meat from it. Right. Whereas with a chicken, like, it's a chicken. It's only one. It's it's a small amount. I think they're called utility chickens when they're missing something. Really? Yeah. That's fucked up. Yeah. But I think it's just the fact that, it, you know, if your two options were to essentially have, like, no idea what's going on and then things just kind of all of a sudden you're done for. Mm-hmm. Or to be, like, essentially a human living in a pen and then, like, being forced in towards, like, a feeding machine. Yeah, so it's a hard question, but I feel like that's a bad solution. Yeah. Let's let's stop using the thing that has the less body mass because it's less efficient. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. But they're also dinosaurs. Chickens. Oh, if they were bigger, they eat us. Yeah, they're monsters. Yeah. You know, have you ever seen a cow cuddle a person? Yeah. It's so cute. Oh. You ever seen a chicken do that? No. Ever? Never. You maybe see chickens that'll like roost. Yeah. You know, they'll like sit in a person's arms, but that's about it. Yeah. Yeah. They're monsters. Like you make a cow big enough and it wouldn't it wouldn't yeah. kill us. Well also you know what happens when chickens live in a chicken population? There's oh, pecking a pecking order. order. That's so fucked up. Yeah, exactly. So imagine you're essentially living in prison. Right? Oh, fuck yeah. When there's a pecking order. Except the shanks are on your face. Exactly. So... It's fucked up. Only one chicken does not get pecked at. And one chicken gets pecked at by every single other chicken. Oh, so when you pecked so much. So when you think about chickens that just live in the dark and just eat all day, every day, for a few weeks until they die, I mean, it's maybe not 100% like the worst thing ever. It's definitely less of a contrast than when you look at a free roaming cow mm. that's for dairy and a cow that gets like put to the slaughter there's a <laughs> much bigger difference there that's true yeah that's... have you ever seen cows um when they get to see light after winter no yeah they like, jump. like they jump. jump i have they, maybe they i have seen that, they run yeah. around and they like butt into each other and they have fun jesus i think like cows are like really close like much closer to like the way that a person's brain works than jesus. chickens are that's pretty that's pretty rough. Fuck chickens. Fuck dinosaurs. So, yeah. Dude, if we found raptors somewhere, we'd eat them. That's actually... <laughs> I, I, A friend of mine mentioned this a long time ago in university, but I still think that this is definitely one of the ways we're going, is insect protein. Mm. And if you've seen... Um, Snowpiercer. Yeah, spoiler alert. So it is possible to live off insect protein. They're actually really high in protein. Yes. And also, who gives a shit what the insects think? Right? Yeah. Yeah. It's still kind of weird. I like how Joe Rogan puts it. He says, if you spray raid on a line of ants, you've killed more souls Mm. than eating a whole chicken. Yeah. Right? You've killed like a hundred life forms. Yeah. But when you consider that insects generally have minimal brain activity. Right. I think I'd rather eat grasshoppers than chickens. And I'd rather eat chickens than cows. And I'd rather eat cows than dogs. Right, so there's obviously a hierarchy there, yeah. And I think um, what is it? Mussels are a good uh, good option. Mm. You know what scallops are? No, scallops I think are a great option for people who are looking for something ethical and like meat based still. Right. So scallops are a type of mussel. They're like ocean going. Yeah. But they're not like soft and gooey like other mussels. Oh. They're these hard little, like, they're not hard, but you just cook them in a pan or whatever. Cook them in a stew, boil and mash them? Boil and mash them, yep. Exactly. Uh, so scallops are a good way to go because they actually have less brain activity, quote unquote brain activity, than plants. Wow. Yeah. So, like, if you're looking for ethical, either eat a rock or pull some scallops yeah. and, and throw them down. So this guy that comes along to buy this thneed pays... Three ninety eight for it, so he pays four dollars. Surprised he didn't pay mm-hmm. three ninety three for Ethne. Why? Because they're kind of rhymes. Well, it was uh, what did he say? Um, yeah, he thought that the Ethne that I knitted was great, and he happily bought it for three ninety eight. Ah, uh-huh. okay. So he pays three ninety eight, and that's for a whole tree. A thneed takes up a whole tuft, a whole tree. Ooh. That's a big deal. How much, like, what time is it? What time period is this? That this was written? Like, when did he write it? Probably somewhere between the 60s and the 80s. But that's, I'm. $4 is still pretty low. 
doesn't even matter what era you're in. Even in the 1900s, when four dollars was a shitload of money, yeah, that's still like one need for one person takes a whole tree down. Yeah, you know, think about how much you get out of a, even a small tree, a 30 foot tree. Like you get way more than one person's worth of resources. Exactly. So, anyways, uh, he even says you never can tell what some people will buy, and I thought that's kind of weird because. He just said a need is something all people need that serves any purpose. And then on the other hand, he's oh. insulting his customer for buying, you know, you never know what people will pay to buy. So is this a need? He's rationalizing. Yeah. Is this a need or is it a waste of money? And I can't tell. Well, he's when he says that everyone needs it, it's one of those things that he's just telling himself. That's an and advertising like, line. Of course. So this is a thief that everyone needs. That's probably why I named it a need. Yeah. Because youth need it. <laughs> you know what youth need? Okay, page page 20 and 21, I put in a quick call. So the Lorax is still trying to lobby on behalf of the trees. And this so is the one like, okay. I repeat, cried the Lorax, I speak for the trees. I'm busy, I told him. Shut up, if you please. <laughs> I thought that one was pretty good. I want to use that one in, in real life. Um, sir, could you... Uh, I just need something. Shut up, if you please. <laughs> if you please. Shut the fuck up, please. So he ran across the room and built a radio phone. Ran across the street and built... Like, is he SpongeBob? No, across the room. Yeah, like a cartoon. He just He just ran to his desk and just built a radio phone. Good for him. Yeah, so then he puts in a quick call. And he calls... Everyone in his family, brothers, aunts, uncles, tells them all to come to work on Thneeds, come and join him yeah. in his new enterprise. And he says that they could be rich if they do it. So now everyone's flocking here. Now it's not just the once learn. Now there's momentum. He's calling in the, the cavalry. The cavalry, yeah. So from one image to the next, you can see his small shop turn into a factory. So now it's no longer the Onceler's shop. Now it's the Thneed factory. Mm. Now it's a totally different thing. And all the Onceler's are just arms. Yeah. Every single Onceler in the Onceler family is arms. The ones that are out chopping trees are arms. The ones that are making Thneeds are arms. It's super clever. I, I really, really appreciate it. But still, they keep this, th- this same idea going where every Thneed is the color of the tree it's made from. Right. Implying that one tree still only makes one thneed. Wow. That's really smart. What? That they... Well, all of it, really. The 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 way that it implies that one thneed is one tree, the way that um, you never see these once they're characters, that creating like an anonymity thing. Mm-hmm. I like that they're just arms. It's very unique. And they're still pulling their horses by these odd-ass sideways wagons. Yeah. You know, they probably switch it side to side every day so they right, don't right, get right. repetitive stress injuries. I think it's probably more of a, um, it's a, it's a budgetary thing. Like you yeah. Just, you just can't. Can't afford two rods. Can't afford two. <laughs> just going to have to take it. These so, bleeding heart liberals and their two-sided horse harnesses. So they massively upgrade. They've got way more production going on. And... The Lorax is still there, but the Lorax is, doesn't have any more. Like, he can't say anything else. Because he's already said it. He's already said, yeah, he's already said what he has to say. And um, I'm just wondering how much wood is left at this point. Like, how, mm. you know, are they stockpiling it? And also, the tree. So that he's using the tufts. He's using what is just at the, the top, top of yeah, the tree. not the rest of it. What is he doing with the wood? Is he stockpiling it? Is he selling mm. it? Because every single image of a truffle tree, it, the whole thing is cut down, right down to the trunk. So he doesn't even need to. He could have been cutting the, the, the tough off and letting to it grow back. To see if it would grow back. But he's not. He's cutting the whole tree down. Oh. And they never make any mention of what's happening to the wood. What a monster. So Holy shit. Yeah, then things start to ram up. Uh... So page 23 and 4 is called the Super Axe Hacker. The Super Axe Hacker. So yeah, th- these are names I've given to these pages, by the way. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so now it's too slow to chop trees down one at a time. Mm-hmm. So he invents a Super Axe Hacker, which can whack off four truffle trees at a time. Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty intense, it's very creative. Well, what he didn't think about is that you need a four tree grabber. 
to go along behind this and grab it four trees at a time. Oh. Right? Because you, you can chop down all the trees you want. You still got to load them in your cart and take them back to the factory. Yeah. Um, so let's just assume he also made a four tree grabber to go along with his four axe hacker. Super axe hacker. <laughs> and at this point, the Lorax stops showing up. Because, like I said, there's nothing to say. Or he got hacked. Yeah, you, or you, you, get, know, you don't know you what get that thing is. out by the super axe yeah, hacker. The way that, uh, that, that um, combines just kill, like, ground Chomp nesting birds. everything in the field, yeah. Small deer. And I see how that happens, too, because I had to go to a farm field to yeah. um, monitor some wells. And the wells are about four feet high, maybe five feet high. The corn mm. was between seven and eight feet high. So you can't see shit yeah. at all. And corn is really sturdy, too, so oh, it's sure. not easy to get through corn. We lived near a, a cornfield when we were kids. I remember yeah. I remember walking in there and being like, ooh. You, You're lost, you like, could, immediately. You could get lost pretty quickly in here. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm so glad I had a GPS or else yeah. it would have been screwed. It would have been, especially because corn is so hard, you can't walk against the grain. So you either walk along the paths or right. 90 degrees to the paths. You can't walk diagonally. Like, if a corn path is going diagonally to the way you're trying to oh, walk. that's brutal. Because then you'd be, like, you'd be getting knocked diagonally forward, and it just wouldn't work. Yeah. So it, it's very weird, but um, what was I? Oh, um, yeah. So the Onesler finally comes back, and I so I called page 25 Onesler in Chief, because that's actually <laughs> what it says on his office, the Onesler in Chief. <laughs> thought that was pretty good. So the Lorax comes back now. And he says, the brown barbalutes don't have enough trees anymore because you're oh, chopping them all down. The brown barbalutes? Yeah, the bears. Oh. So now the brown barbalutes don't have enough food because they used to eat the truffle of fruits from the truffle of trees. And because he's chopping the whole tree down, there's nothing left for the bears. They can't use mm. the shade and they don't have their food. Mm. So the onceler obviously has to take these concerns and then... He tells him that they're all getting sick. All the the bears are getting sick because oh, no. they either have no food or they're eating the wrong food. Oh, no, bears. And then he says, I have no choice. The Onesler sends the bears away. He They have to leave because this is no longer a place for them. They need yeah. food, so they have to go somewhere else. And so the Onesler says, he felt sad as he watched them go. But business and business, and business is business, and business must go. Oh, Jesus. I'm so much better at this normally. And I, the onceler, felt sad as I watched them all go. But business is business, and business must grow, regardless of crummies and tummies, you know? Crummies and tummies? Because that, that's what he said. They're getting crummies in their tummies. Oh. Yeah, so the onceler is now actually gone to the point where he's saying... Even at the cost of the wildlife, mm. you know, crummies and tummies makes it sound diminished, but yeah. really it is. It is malnutrition of wildlife. The crummies and tummies. Yeah, and he's saying, but that's just a cost of doing business. And he says, business must grow. Mm. So that he's pretty steadfast in that belief. He's probably raking money in by now. He must be. So okay, this is my favorite page. I'm just gonna read this page. Um, so the page twenty-eight. I meant no harm, I most truly did not, but I had to grow bigger, so bigger I got. I biggered my factories, I biggered my roads, I biggered my wagons, I biggered the loads. Of needs I shipped out, I was shipping them forth, to the south, to the east, to the west, to the north. I went right on biggering, selling more th needs, and I biggered my money, which everyone needs. Wow. That's a cool page. That's a really well. That's really well written. I imagine he had a lot of um, red underlines when he was typing that. <laughs> yeah, um, <coughs> we're not so sure about this biggered word. <coughs> um, yeah, I, th I think it's interesting that he doesn't mention why he needs to grow. Yeah, it's just like he doesn't say what oh, the money's I, for. I I just had to. Well, demand was increasing, so I had Isn't to increase supply, which increased demand. <laughs> Which can increase supply. But wow, that's a really good point. That he, ne he never really quantifies why he needs the money or why the business needs to improve. But he seems to be pretty devout to that idea that business must grow. And he he went from having the Onesler wagon to now he's got three you need th need wagons. 
flying out of his factory. Yeah. Going every direction, sending out the needs. They're putting out, like, blue smoke. And you can even see that his factory is starting to ramp up. And he seems to be dissolving the trees in something or running them through some sort of machine. And you can just tell that things are now not what they were. He's no longer stitching up Thneeds in his warehouse and yeah. selling them to per, to a person. You know, at this point, maybe Thneeds cost more money. Oh, things are going out in boxes now. He's not even making full Thneeds. He's probably making Thneed kits. Maybe. But and he's probably got to put the Thneeds in a box to send them out. And the, the, um, the illustrations now are... Uh, of almost entirely chopped down trees with a couple trees still up. I was wondering if you're going to notice that. I like that. Yeah. So the trees are starting to disappear and you can see the stumps all over the place, especially close to the Thneed factory. Um, and this actually reminds me of a comic I once saw. And there's a, a guy in a tattered suit and a couple of kids and they're all sitting around a campfire, sitting on the ground. And the guy said, sure, we destroyed the planet. But for a brief moment in time, we generated a lot of interest for the shareholders. <laughs> and I think that that's really appropriate here. Because yeah. the planet is being destroyed around their factory as if their factory is some sort of poison pill. And yet, they're still going at it and generating profit. Only when the last tree is cut and the last fish is, fish is caught will you find that money cannot be eaten. Oh. Yeah. So then, okay, so I called this one the argument at the pipe house. <laughs> and then he came back, I was fixing some pipes. So they're, just, they're in the pipe house. <laughs> um, so the Lorax comes back and he says that the smog is now a problem. Those swami swans I was telling you mm-hmm. about, um, they can't sing anymore. Oh, because no. the smog is too thick, so their vocal cords are all messed up. It's all no. gummed. And he talks about how the factories are now running night and day. Oh. So it's a constant thing. And now the environment has, like, no opportunity yeah. to recover. No rest. No rest. Exactly. Exactly. And so very much like the other things, the Barbaloots, he has to send them away. Because they can't live in the smog, so they need to find a new place that they can live. I love the, the way that, they're, that these birds are illustrated. It looks like it's hard for them to fly in the first place. Yeah, they look like uh, featherless birds. Yeah. They like, look like looks, they've been plucked. It looks like they're just like really flapping to get anywhere. Really. Yeah, they're very thin birds with very small wings. And they have like a fat stomach. Yeah, they have a very large midsection compared to their, their others. So then he says that the swans may need to fly for a month or a year to find a new place to live. Oh, no. Depending on how far they have to go. They have to escape the fog, and they need a place that has trees. And at this point, the trees are really starting to disappear. There's a couple in the photo. Mm-hmm. But for the most part, they're gone. I'm guessing this is intentional because I'm sure there's going to be a shot where there are no trees, right? Well, it's definitely leading up to, yeah. to the trees being gone. So then the Lorax... At this point, this is my only explanation for where the wood is going. And the Lorax confronts the Onesler and he says, wait, did I miss a page? No. Confronts the Onesler and says, look what you're doing. He's making this goo, two different types of goo, gluppity glup and schlippity slop. <laughs> right? <laughs> because why not? And he says, do you know what you're doing with the goo when you're done? And he says, I'll show you. And he takes him to the pond where the Onesler is just dumping all of the goo into the pond the wholesale. Goo. And I assume he's not doing anything. At this point, the truffle trees don't even have color. Yeah. They're gray. Whoa. So the smog has now basically killed everything, including the product. Yeah. But... And you wonder if they're making gray thneeds now. Oh, no. Who knows? Wow. I don't know. But, obviously, wonder, it's not good. I wonder if, if like, a... Uh... Some like a, a visionary director could make a movie which is like the the, the consumerist side of the need situation, where like slowly the environment is being destroyed at the same rate that needs are being dropping produced, in, in yeah. quality, and eventually they're just gray needs, and everyone's coughing and shit. <laughs> and you get poison when you put it on. Yeah. So I called this page. You're glumping the pond. This is what he says. You're glumping the pond where the humming fish hummed. 
Um, so now all the humming fish have to leave as well because their pond is now gooped up. Yeah. They can't hum because they literally have goopy slop it's, in it's, their gills. It's much harder for fish to leave. They actually have to walk on their feet. They'll walk on their fins and get woefully weary in search of some water that isn't so smeary. Oh, no. So they're literally going to walk on their fins to try and find a new pond. They're like they're like snakeheads. So they're dead. They're not getting to another pond. They're dead. Oh, yeah, because right? I guess we never find out, right? How far are the fish going to go? Yeah, no, they're dead, for sure. Weary. Like, the bears might survive, and the birds could definitely survive if they find a new place, but the fish are done for, for sure. Yeah. So they're forced out of their pond. And then the Onceler gets mad at the Lorax. And he says, you, he calls him dad. Oh, no. So he's like, he's, he's done with the Lorax being a naysayer. And he says, all you do is tell me what I do is bad. And then he says to him, I'm telling you, I have my rights and I intend to keep on doing what I do. Mm. And he says... I'm figuring on biggering and biggering and biggering, turning more truffle trees into thneeds, which everyone, everyone, everyone needs. So he's doubled down hard. Yeah. And in the concept, background yeah. of the image on this page, you can see one, one truffle tree. <laughs> oh, and it's and it's it's bright so that it actually stands out and at that very oh, moment no. we heard a loud whack from outside in the fields came a sickening smack of an axe on a tree then we heard the tree fall the very last truffle a tree of them all oh no so the field is empty there's no truffle trees left and i'm not reading anymore that just that sounded like it was gonna rhyme yeah but the, <laughs> that's <Yeah>. me <laughs> so now all the trees are used up at this point and all of his friends leave no yeah. more no more th- needs, no more work. No more yeah. work, no more money. So they all jumped into his cars, into the Onceler's cars. And took and off. drove off. What are you going to do about it? Under the shitty smelling sky <laughs> with all the dead trees and the lack of animals. And it says the only things that were left were the big empty factory, the Lorax, and the Onceler. Mm. It's all sitting there, miserable, essentially. So this is where the Lorax finally gets lifted. Oh, I went the wrong way. Went the wrong way in my notes. Oh, no. Oh, no. The same way that the Onesler went the wrong way. Yeah. He was misguided. For years. Yeah. Very misguided. So then the Onesler just looks at him, gives him this really dreary look, and then grabs himself by the seat of his pants, and then <laughs> heists himself On his own up, petard. Up and threw a hole in the clouds. <laughs> so the one slay lifted himself by the seat of his pants, threw the clouds, and was gone. Yeah, good for him. Leaving the one slayer alone in his big empty factory. Just arms. So the one slayer, no, the, uh, the Lorax, leaves behind a pile of rocks with the word unless written on it. What? Yeah. That's cryptic as fuck. Very cryptic. And he says that that was a long, long time ago and that the buildings have just been falling apart and he's, I assume the Onceler has basically only been taking care of his own home ever since. Mm. So these factories are dilapidated and they're breaking down. And he says, but now I understand what the Lorax meant by unless. The Lorax was saying that unless someone like you, unless someone like the boy or the reader of this story cares to bring back the forest, nothing's going to change. Yeah. So it is an unless moment. And then that's when the Onceler says, so, Catch calls the Onceler. He lets Sorry, something this fall. Is, this is now in the past. This is, this is We're now going back to, we're out of the story that the Onceler has said. The story the Onceler has yeah, told has now led up to the present moment. Right. And he says, so, Cut calls the Onceler. He let something fall. It's a truffle seed. It's the last one of all. You're in charge of the last of the truffle seeds, and the truffle trees are what everyone needs. Plant a new truffle, treat it with care, clean, give it clean water, and feed it fresh air. Grow a forest, protect, protect it from axes that hack, then the Lorax and all his friends may come back. Wow. That's how this story ends. Really? 
So it's not a magical seed that gets planted and everything goes back to normal. He ends it with a message. It's a moral. And a moral that a lot of work is to be done, but hope is not lost. Wow. Yeah. And that's actually lends some credit to what you were talking about, about the Lorax being a false idea, like a, a fiction mm-hmm. generated by the Onesler's own imagination. Yeah. Because when he says he wants the Lorax to come back, the Lorax speaks for the trees. But there's no trees to speak for. Exactly. So when the trees come back, the Lorax will as well, even though the Lorax is only something in the Onesler's head. Wow. That's my guess. My guess is that every time he saw the animals go, he felt bad, but he used the Onesler, he used the Lorax to be this buffer between him and the actual decisions that he's making. So that they aren't his own. And so, in some ways, he feels like he is feeling for the animals by having the Lorax in his head. Yeah. Right? The Lorax is voicing those concerns for him so that he doesn't have to do it. And it's a way to manifest his his issue with this, because otherwise, if he could actually admit that he was the one who felt bad, that he would stop production. Exactly. And then he wouldn't be able to bigger his factory. Yeah, it seems like he was biggering his 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 company for the sake of it. It's almost like he was trying to find something, but he didn't know what it was. Because the way the way that he, his house isn't that impressive, like it's not like he he, it's he, true. he it's not lavish. Yeah, he didn't like um, recluse back to his giant ranch where he like had a couple of trees, and he's like, it's fine, don't worry about it. He lived in this huge like Castlevania-esque tower where he just sat there being sad about what he did almost like he intended to do that like he wanted to be left in his own silence I think what happened was when he called his family he lost control of the situation yeah and so the little voice became bigger well no it became quieter almost because remember how he says that when his family showed up and they started the production that the Lorax was silent for a while yeah so I think the Lorax was there. You know, it's like the first time you do something bad, you feel bad. Mm-hmm. The second time you do something bad, you don't feel as bad. And What's third the, and fourth and fifth. And they call it the floodgates. Exactly. And I think that was starting to happen right up until the animals started leaving. And those were the big things that impacted him, right? Yeah. Boom, bears are gone. Boom, the, the swans are leaving. Fish are gone. He probably kept saying, like, as long as I have my business. And then when the business was done, his people left, and then he was finally able to realize he had nothing. It was all connected. He was he was choosing to believe that the that the the bears and the and the fish and the birds and the trees and his company were not connected. That it was him versus the nature, and then he finally realized it's all part of one thing. Yeah. The same way that we we do that. I mean, the, the whole thing is clearly intended to teach children um, about what we're doing to the earth. And I think maybe his intention was that if you teach it to them in a simple way as children, they will grow up with that idea. And every time someone else brings up, like, the rainforest, it gets stronger and stronger uh, as an idea. And now pretty much everybody in our society agrees with something, but we still have... That's, that's why he left that unless. Because we all talk about this shit, but we don't do it. Cares a whole awful lot. That's what he says. Unless yeah. somebody cares a whole awful lot. Yeah. And that means more than posting it on Facebook. Yeah. That's not caring. Sharing isn't caring. No, not in that situation. No. no. Sharing is caring when you split your food. Sharing is not caring online. That's not how that works. Yeah. That is actually a saying that's going to get really twisted. What's that? Sharing is caring. Yeah. Because as you go into the future, sharing is going to become synonymous. It is already synonymous with digital exchange of information, to share things with your friends. And people are going to think that that's what that means. Sharing is caring. Well, it's kind of like friends, the term friends. Ooh, that's changed. Because I I have seven PlayStation 4 friends, and I play with all of them regularly. I know them fairly well because Mm -hmm. they're actually what I would consider like gaming friends. Yeah. But there was a point there where I had like 20 people on there. There was always people online that I was not playing with. And one day I went through and I just deleted everyone that I haven't played with in like a, a week. 
basically. And I was like, nope, nope, there nope, you go. nope, 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 nope. And now when I when it says how many people are online, that's people to play with. Yeah. That's actually like a relevant number. I don't check who it is anymore. I'm just like, ooh, there's people. Here we go. Yeah, it's true. And especially, you know, that's that's one thing where you had between nine and twenty or whatever. Mm-hmm. But when you have five hundred two thousand there's friends. Twitter pages that, that do the the like the um a subscribe for a subscribe thing, like a follow for follow. So you go and follow them and they have fifteen thousand followers. But they also have they also follow twenty five thousand people. That the, those two numbers are so silly. Like it's like our subscriber count right now is like one hundred and thirty, mm-hmm. but maybe three people watch. Yeah, that's the true term, like the re- true meaning of subscribe, as in to believe in something yeah. or to be part of something. Our subscribers are maybe five. That's yeah. the real subscribers. And you, Verified me, subscribers. and our dad are three of those five. Exactly. So there might be a couple people out there. But I don't really get, like, people, when I when I tell people about my YouTube channel, they're like, how many subscribers do you have? And I'm like, it doesn't fucking matter. Yeah. You have three or four viewers. It's not about the I don't, I don't give a shit about yeah. 129 people that aren't watching. I don't yeah. care about you. 129 people that scroll past our videos in their feed. Every fucking day. And you know what? I'm one of those subscribers in some cases to other channels. Oh, yeah. And there's times where I keep seeing their stuff, and I'm like, I don't ever watch this. What am I doing? And I unsubscribe. And then I'm watching their video later, like weeks later, and, I'm, and I see the button that says subscribe, and I'm like, I'm not subscribed to these people. I'm like, oh, right. Uh-huh. It's because I don't watch them on a regular basis. Yeah. Yeah, I think the, the new world r- treats things more importantly when they count as a connection. Mm -hmm. So a friend or a subscriber or a follower, whatever it's called, if someone is going to see something you throw out there, that's the important thing. Yeah. Right? It's not about getting everyone to watch your videos. It's about knowing that if you threw something up there, you could reliably say a million people are going to at least glance at it. Yep. Half of those people maybe will look, a quarter of them will actually care and like, a tenth of them will care enough to comment and, and, you know, get involved. Yeah, it's the 20-80 principle. Yeah, the that Pareto principle. Twenty. That, that's that's how our, our future Patreon thing will work, that less than 20% of our of our viewership will make up 80% of our profit. Yeah, of our income. Yeah. That's very true. Because that's like, you look at, at almost every Patreon out there, and it's a small number. It's like 600 people who are, who are, who are providing this person a whole month's worth of, of enough money to do it for a living when their subscribers are 200,000. There's so many people in that group that don't care enough about the content they're watching to actually support them. Mm-hmm. That's kind of sad. And at the same time, there's certain people like Jim Sterling. I don't donate to Jim Sterling. It's 10 grand a month is what he's making on Patreon. I don't need to help him. I help um, Clemps, who's making like 600 a month. People that need it. Um, but that that mentality, if everyone was like, Jim Sterling doesn't need the money anymore, it would, go. It would just f- suddenly plummet. And he'd be like, thank God for me, but see you later. Yeah, but too bad for you. <laughs> but I'm going back to, I don't know, whatever he did before this. Yeah. Yeah, I think that it's uh, it's a unique world we're moving into. And I think that the Lorax is actually a really good idea. Yes. It's a really good way to present it to people because... The Lorax doesn't have to be a production medium. It doesn't have to be about cutting down trees and putting them up. It can be about software. It can be about whatever. Yeah. Um, Destruction. It's about irresponsibility leading to hazardous consequences. Right. That's really what it's about. And it's also about ignoring your responsibility. You know the the great uh, expression, with great responsibility, no, with great power comes great responsibility. I always used to think that was a superhero thing Mm. because that's what it sounds like. It sounds like those who are gifted beyond other humans' power are granted great responsibility. But that means in every single sense of the term, those with power have responsibility. If you are a white person 
in the 1800s yeah. when slavery is alive and well, you are a powerful person by default. Yeah. So you have more responsibility. Yes. More emotional, more moral responsibilities. And nowadays, if you're a person who makes a lot of money, you have power because of how much influence goes into money, right? Yeah. So you, no matter who you are, no matter who you have power over, you proportionately need to be more and more responsible, which sucks. Being responsible is not fun. No. No part of that is enjoyable. No one wakes up in the morning and goes, I can't wait to be responsible today. <laughs> that's well, I, just not how it goes. I have all the power over the channel, which also means that when I don't know what I'm supposed to upload yeah. and I have <laughs> shit to do, then I'm like, oh, fuck, I guess I got to figure this out. Yeah, exactly. I don't, I'm not, I don't call you up and I'm like, hey, can you come over? And it's like, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's like, I have the power and the responsibility, while as you don't have the power or the responsibility. Or the responsibility. Right. And the only reason why it works is because you trust in what I do. But it's also a consistent thing. If if one day I just... Fuck, now that I'm thinking about it, I still haven't fixed that Shovel Knight episode. I haven't fixed that uh, the 1984 podcast. I told you that one's still funny. Yeah. It's a break in the middle of our second part of our 1984 <laughs> discussion. It's silent. It's like a minute and a half, just silent break. <laughs> It's a two-hour podcast. The one-minute break is not the end of the world. Yeah, the Shovel Knight one needs to be fixed. I don't remember the it's, Shovel Knight it's, one. It's a, an episode that got cut in half. It just ends suddenly. I do remember that now. Yeah, okay. I like, remember. Like OG. You haven't fixed that? No. It's been a long time. I know, it has been a long time. I probably right. mentioned that early in the summer. <laughs> no. <laughs> it was at that least was like a, a month ago. Okay, I was going to say it was at least a month ago. Yeah, yeah. Which I guess is late in the summer. You're right. But yeah. Oh, my. Well... Thank you for joining us in this discussion of the Lorax. I hope that you come back for our discussions of all the other things we like to Bears on go wheels. through. Bears on wheels, for sure. Uh, things in the works. I started trying to read To Kill a Mockingbird. Mm. It seems really boring, so I might have to wait before I start that one. Yeah. Uh, but Paint It Black is next. Ooh. Yeah, Rolling Stones, Paint It Black is going to be next. Uh, and then, <laughs> I've got a red door <laughs> and I want to paint it black. Uh, and then after that, probably The Giver. Oh. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah. So that's uh, that's what's coming up. So hopefully this will be late September. You're hearing this. And then yeah. uh, hopefully by the end of this year, we'll have a couple more songs, a couple more stories. Ooh. And uh, we will see you next time. Yeah. Thanks for stopping by. Have a good one.